In the previous lecture, we focused on step one of the citric acid cycle and we saw that in step one, we basically take an acetyl group and attach it onto an oxaloacetate molecule to form a six carbon intermediate known as the citrate molecule. And so in this lecture, I'd like to focus on what happens next. So we're going to focus on steps two, three, and four of the citric acid cycle. And so let's begin with step number two. Now, the entire point of step number two is basically to take the citrate molecule and to prepare it for oxidative decarboxylation that will take place in step three and step four of the citric acid cycle. So in these two steps, we're basically going to produce carbon dioxide molecules and we're going to abstract those high energy electrons that we're going to use on the electron transport chain. But before steps three and four take place, we have to prepare the citrate molecule. And the way that we prepare that citrate molecule is by actually changing the position of this hydroxyl group. So citrate and isocitrate are actually isomers. They have the same exact molecular formula, but they differ in the position of this hydroxyl group. On the citrate, the hydroxyl is attached onto this carbon, let's call it carbon three, and on this molecule, the hydroxyl is instead attached onto this carbon here. And we see that to go from this reactant to this product, we have to go through an intermediate. And so this step two is actually a two-step process. So in process one of step two, we have a dehydration reaction. Why? Well, because we want to basically remove this hydroxyl group. And in addition, we remove this H to form the water molecule and form the double bond between this carbon and this carbon here. And once we form this double bond, this water molecule that comes in in step two will basically undergo a hydration reaction. The water will act as a nucleophile and instead of attacking this carbon, it will attack this carbon because if the water molecule attacked this carbon, we would have simply reformed the citrate molecule. But if the water attacks this carbon, which is basically less hindered because it contains a smaller group on this side compared to this large group here, the water molecule is able to actually attack from this side because of less hindrance and so once it attacks that side we form the isocitrate molecule so the entire point of this step is to basically prepare the citrate molecule for oxidative decarboxylation that takes place in step three as well as step four now this double bonded intermediate molecule is known as cis aconitate and because of this cis aconitate, the enzyme that catalyzes step two is known as aconitase. So once again, once citrate is formed in step one of the citric acid cycle, it must be transformed into its isomeric form isocitrate. And this reaction, we basically transfer a hydroxyl group from the third carbon onto the adjacent carbon shown here. And what this process does, once again, is it prepares the molecule for a decarboxylation reaction that we'll talk about in the next step. Now, the enzyme that catalyzes this step is known as aconitase. And this aconitase actually contains an iron sulfur component. And that's why this molecule, the aconitase enzyme, is known as an iron sulfur enzyme, an iron sulfur protein. Now, actually, it contains a ratio of four iron to four sulfur uh, inorganic sulfide atoms. And this complex is found on the active side and it binds onto the hydroxyl, not the hydroxyl, onto the carboxylate ion group of the citrate. And that holds the citrate molecules within the active side and allows the catalysis to actually take place. So, once again, step two is a two-step process. So we have this dehydration and hydration that is catalyzed by the conotase, which is an iron sulfur protein because it uses the iron sulfur complex to carry out these two reactions. Now, once we form the isocitrate molecule now, this six carbon molecule is ready to undergo the first oxidative decarboxylation step of the citric acid cycle. And this is what happens in step three. So 
Once the isocitrate is formed, it is ready to undergo the first oxidative decarboxylation step. And this reaction is catalyzed by isocitrate dehydrogenase. Why dehydrogenase? Well, remember, a dehydrogenase is an enzyme that basically abstracts those electrons attached onto the H ion to basically form that reduced NADH molecule. So in this particular case, in the same exact way that we have a two-step process here, we also have a two-step process here. And in the first step of step three, we take the isocitrate and we react it with the nicotine, uh, nicotine amide adenine dinucleotide in the oxidized form. And so in this process, the NAD plus is actually reduced into the NADH and the isocitrate molecule is oxidized to form the oxalosuccinate and we also release this H plus ion. So the first reaction involves the abstraction of a pair of high energy electrons to form the NADH and this high energy intermediate known as oxalosuccinate. And oxalosuccinate is unstable because it is a beta keto acid. So Remember from organic chemistry that beta keto acids are generally unstable molecules. Now, the NADH that we produced will be used by the electron transport chain as we'll discuss in a future lecture. So now let's move on to step two of this process that takes place in step three. So in the next step, we take that oxalosuccinate and by the activity of the same enzyme isocitrate dehydrogenase, we mix it with an H plus ion and we basically form a molecule known as alpha ketoglutarate. So the highly unstable oxalosuccinate can now undergo a decarboxylation reaction. So this was the oxidation reduction reaction and this is the decarboxylation step. And actually, as we'll discuss in much more detail in a future lecture, this essentially is the step. The formation of the alpha ketoglutarate is the step that actually determines the rate at which the citric acid cycle actually takes place. So this is a very important step. And if we sum up these two steps, these two reactions of step three, this is the net reaction that we're going to get. Notice that the oxalosuccinate molecules don't appear on either sides because they cancel out. So if we sum up this reaction with this reaction, this cancels out and so does this as well as the H plus here and H plus here. So this is the net reaction that we get. On the reactant side, the isocitrate that we produced in step two and the NAD plus that acts as the carrier and picks up those two electrons that we abstract from the isocitrate. We form the NADH, the carbon dioxide molecule is removed from the isocitrate and we form this alpha ketoglutarate molecule. Now let's move on to step four. In step four, once again, we have another oxidative decarboxylation step. We're going to remove yet another carbon dioxide in the process, abstracting the pair of high energy electrons to basically form the reduced NADH molecule, which eventually will be used by the electron transport chain to generate those high energy adenosine triphosphate molecules. And in this step, we actually use the coenzyme A, the same coenzyme A that we used in pyruvate decarboxylation. So the next step is the second oxidative decarboxylation reaction of the citric acid cycle. This step involves the conversion of the alpha ketoglutarate into the succinyl coenzyme A. And this is what the reaction looks like. So this is the net reaction. On the reactant side, we have the product of step three, the alpha ketoglutarate. In the presence of the NAD+, we need this because this acts as the carrier to actually abstract those electrons. And we have the coenzyme, the, the coenzyme A-CoA. And on the product side, we essentially attach, we remove this component that produces the carbon dioxide and we attach the coenzyme A onto this bond to form the high energy thioester bond. And this is the bond that will be broken in the steps to come as we'll discuss in the next several lectures. Now, this succinyl coenzyme A 
basically is the product of step four. And the enzyme that catalyzes step four is known as alpha ketoglutarate because this is a substrate molecule that binds into the enzyme dehydrogenase complex. And in fact, this complex is very similar to the complex that catalyzed step one of the citric acid cycle. How is it similar? Well, this complex, just like that complex, also consists of three different types of enzymes and it also uses many different types of cofactors. So we have the E1 enzyme that is known as alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase that uses the TPP. So thiamine pyrophosphate cofactor. We have the E2 known as dihydrolipoyl succinyl transferase that uses the lipoic acid derivative. And we have E3 dihydrolipoyl dehydrogenase that uses the FAD. So this large complex, the alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex consists of these three enzymes and it uses different types of coenzymes to carry out the steps of step four. And if you want to learn more about the mechanism of this particular step, go back and watch my lecture on step one because these two steps are actually very similar to one another.